Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Tuesday, January 24th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Opposition leader Raila Odinga says he does not recognize William Ruto as president of Kenya. We as a reject the 2022 election results totally. And we consider the Kenya Kwanza government illegitimate. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen continues her three-country Africa visit today, Tuesday, in Zambia. Zambia's main opposition party responds to concerns it is declining in popularity. The U.N. condemns recent attack on humanitarian workers in South Sudan. South Africa hosts the Russian foreign minister despite criticism. Contrary to the assertions by our critics, South Africa is not abandoning its neutral position on the Russian-Ukraine conflict. And the World Health Organization says 500,000 people die prematurely from trans fats annually. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Kenya's opposition leader Raila Odinga says he does not recognize President William Ruto as the head of the country. Speaking Monday at a public rally in Nairobi, Odinga said the electoral body of Kenya manipulated the results in favor of the president, who he claims was illegitimately elected. Odinga's allegations come a few days after Ruto publicly claimed that the opposition had planned to assassinate former electoral body chairperson Wafula Chibukati last August for announcing results that did not favor Odinga and his party. Maureen Ojiambo reports. Azimio la umoja one Kenya coalition leader El Odinga returned home on Monday from South Africa and proceeded to a public rally where he insisted that he won the August elections but was denied victory. In his speech, Odinga says he has data gathered from people he claims are from the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission, IEBC, showing that he won with over 2 million votes. Gallant IEBC whistleblowers have now published the true and authentic results of the 2022 elections. Here is our clarion call. One, we as a Zimio reject the 2022 election results totally. We, we cannot and will not recognize the Kenya Kwanza regime and we consider the Kenya Kwanza government illegitimate. Two, we don't recognize Mr. William Ruto as the president of Kenya. The opposition demands that the election records of the 2022 elections at the IEBC be made public and be audited by an independent body. Odinga says the former IEBC chairman Wafula Chebukate collaborated with some board officials to steal his victory. He says Ruto's single-handedly attempts to reconstitute the body must stop and Kenyans should be allowed to participate in the rebuilding of the commission. The IEBC... Under the then chairman Wafula Chebukati, two commissioners, Abdi Gulie and Boya Molu, and the chief executive officer, Marjan Hussein Marjan, formed a cartel within the IBC to the exclusion of the four new commissioners. Disregarded the votes, you cast and cook their own results. Fellow Kenyans, the presidential results announced unilaterally were entirely made up and had nothing to do with the votes you cast. The opposition has called on Kenyans to reject the policies of the current administration, claiming they are making life unbearable for many Kenyans. At the same time, President William Ruto says holding demonstrations by the opposition may not resolve problems faced by Kenyans. We will unite all our citizens, irrespective of how they voted, so that we can put to shame those who have the habit of using blackmail and threats to secure their personal family interests. President Ruto last week claimed persons linked to the opposition planned in August to assassinate former IEBC chairman Wafula Chebukate. Allegations the opposition have refuted by calling them uncalled for. Already, the Electoral Commission has had at least three of its members resign for violating the law. Former chairman Wafula Chebukate has already retired from the commission after serving for two terms. The deputy chairperson and three others violated the law when they held a parallel conference, distancing themselves from the presidential results. 
According to the IEBC constitution, their actions violated the rules of the commission. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Jambo in Sacramento, California. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is in Zambia to highlight joint efforts to improve global health and to meet with President Hakainde Hichalema. Kathy Short reports from Lusaka. A day after her arrival in Zambia, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen inaugurated the newly built U.S.-funded Zambia National Public Health Institute. The institute was established to help Zambia prevent transmission of deadly diseases like COVID-19, monitor threats to public health and effectively respond to any outbreaks. Yellen said health security has been a key pillar of the partnership between Zambia and the United States over the past two decades. It's important to sustainably finance public health institutions, she said, as the cost of preparedness is lower than the cost of responding to an outbreak once it starts. Yellen said the United States remains committed to improving regional and global health security through its 450 million US dollar contribution to the newly launched pandemic fund. Let me say how much we value our partnership, how important it is for the health of uh, individual African countries, Africa as a whole, and beyond that, the global global health situation. Um, We've had a long partnership and I think it's been a productive one. It's important for it to continue. Earlier on Monday, Yellen visited Milan Laboratories Distribution Center in Lusaka. Milan Laboratory is a U.S. firm that employs 75 workers in Zambia, helping to distribute anti-malarial and antiretroviral treatments. While Yellen visited the facilities Monday, Africa Centers for Disease Control Director Ahmed Ogwe Omar put out a live virtual message to the visiting secretary commending the U.S. government for its massive investment in global health. Omar emphasized the need for the local manufacturing of drugs to deal with health challenges in Africa. Local production is very key to um, the health security of the continent and by extension for the whole uh, globe. And um, investing in uh, well-selected Uh, manufacturing facilities for different health products from diagnostics, therapeutics to vaccines is really, really important for the way in which we are going to be handling the next round of uh, outbreaks and, God forbid, another pandemic. Yellen also expressed confidence that Zambia's debt restructuring process will be concluded soon, adding that this is in the interest of creditors as well as Zambia faces a delay in the process. This follows the International Monetary Fund's approval of a 1.3 billion US dollar bailout last August aimed at kickstarting the country's ailing economy and restructuring its debt. Zambia's total public debt to foreign and local lenders was just shy of 27 billion US dollars at the end of June 2022, according to the Ministry of Finance. Zambia foreign debt is spread across diverse regions with 6 billion US dollars owed to China and the rest owed to various banks, nations and multilateral institutions. Meanwhile, Yellen also said she's happy with the Zambian president's efforts to address corruption. While in Zambia, she will hold bilateral talks with Hichilema and his ministers as well as business leaders and civil society. During her trip, Yellen is highlighting the Biden administration's efforts to deepen U.S.-Africa economic ties, including steps to expand trade and investment for sustainable and inclusive economic growth. This follows the United States-Africa Leaders Summit held last month in Washington, where President Joe Biden announced over 15 billion U.S. dollars in two-way trade and investment commitments. Yellen will remain in Zambia until Tuesday when she leaves for South Africa. Kathy Short for VOA News, Lusaka, Zambia. The Governor United Party for National Development, UPND, is expressing concern that the country's democracy could be hampered by the downward spiral of the electoral fortunes of the main opposition 
Patriot from the PF party. The statement comes as the PF lost 21 parliamentary seats to the UPND in by-elections over the last five months. But the PF accused the governing party of using state institutions to narrow the political space to ensure it won the recent vote. This as the PF readies its plans to choose new leaders of the group in a party convention scheduled for March this year. Viewers Peter Clotty spoke with Raphael Nakachinda, member of the Patriot Front's Central Committee for Information and Publicity. As far as we're concerned, this is basically just a smoke screen. Those statements that are coming from the UPND are meant to try and create a narrative when, in fact, there is a lot that is going on to try and manipulate things in advance. There is an ongoing continuous water registration, which, of course, the Zambian people have been demanding for. But it is being done in a biased manner. There are three provinces which ethnically favor the current president. So it's a well-orchestrated arrangement, but we're also doing our own part to make sure that we mobilize the party, we organize ourselves, and in the nearest future, put a leadership in place that will start marching towards 2026. The ruling party is expressing concern that the challenges you are having in winning by elections basically is bad for the burgeoning democracy in Zambia. Your reaction? You know, we have uh, a government in place and they have a very strong propaganda machinery that they are running. But all we can say for the, the global community to notice is that the, the democratic space in the country is shrinking. The institutions of government are being destroyed each and every day that it is passing. The judiciary is getting paralyzed. And people should pay attention to this because before long, we we'll end up with a banana republic in Zambia. The by elections that the UPND are priding themselves to, if you examine, like I said, they use an uh, method to win those by elections. I understand your party is also planning to choose new leadership uh, to lead the party uh, to the next general election. Uh, the convention coming up, I understand, in March. How ready will you be uh, before March? While well, we are working uh, 24-7 uh, to do the necessary things that are supposed to be done and put in place all the necessary logistics for that uh, to happen. But I must hasten to say that uh, we are prioritizing the institutionalization of um, the operation of the party and the branding of the party by way of, uh, first of all, amending the constitution of the party. So there is a process of uh, consultation with different stakeholders in the country and the citizens of the Republic of Zambia, plus the members of Patriotic Front, on the best way the party can be structured in relation to some of the concerns that the Zambian people raised in how the party was structured and how we ran government. So the amendment of the constitution is the, the first step that we undertake towards rebranding, towards restructuring ourselves before we can go to the elective conference. So we may end up with a two-tier process. The first uh, conference will be to amend the constitution. And after the constitution is amended, submitted to relevant authorities and acknowledged as such, then we will then proceed to prepare for the elective conference that will come later. So all that process, we're trying to see if we can condense it or achieve that within this certain period of time. But of course, the Central Committee reserves the power and right to revise the, the calendar if we, we saw or uh, see that uh, we may not be able to achieve everything within a period of time. That was Raphael Nakachinda, a member of the Central Committee of Zambia's Opposition Patriotic Front Party. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Butt in Washington. Today is Tuesday, January 24th. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Sudan, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, also known as UNCHA, is condemning a recent attack on humanitarian workers and assets in the greater people administration administrative area, saying the attackers injured one worker and stole valuables. For VOA News, Deng Kai Deng has the details from Boa. The humanitarian community condemns in strongest terms the attack on humanitarian workers and assets in Pibor, in the greater Pibor administrative area, 
We are united in our call for Im an immediate end of these repeated attacks of violence against civilians and humanitarians. That's Annette Hans, Deputy Head of UN OCHA in South Sudan. In a recorded statement to South Sudan in focus, Hans also said several armed attackers broke into an international NGO compound in Pibor last Wednesday. At least one humanitarian worker was beaten and required medical attention. The attackers targeted the NGO looking for cash and other assets and stole these valuables. Earlier this month, unidentified attackers killed two aid workers in the Abia administrative area and another aid worker in Jonglei state. Peter Bander Awarat, humanitarian coordinator at Interim for South Sudan, said in a statement such attacks on humanitarians who provide critical services to the most vulnerable people are beyond comprehension, adding the ongoing violent attacks against humanitarians inadvertently hamper the delivery of much-needed life-saving support to millions of people affected in times of escalating conflict. Our right says the victims are humanitarian workers, most of whom are South Sudanese nationals. He says the indirect victims are the most vulnerable whom humanitarian workers serve in many communities. South Sudan is one of the most dangerous places in the world for aid workers. Nine humanitarian workers were killed in the line of duty and 450 incidents were reported last year and three humanitarian workers have already been killed this year, according to OCHA. OCHA says protecting humanitarian workers and civilians is the duty of South Sudan authorities and the humanitarian community is calling on authorities to do all they can to stop attacks on humanitarians and civilians and bring the perpetrators swiftly to justice. It says ending impunity and ensuring accountability is critical to protecting humanitarians and civilians alike and to bringing long-term peace to South Sudan. For VOA News, I am Deng Gaideng in Bor. The World Health Organization is calling for the total elimination of trans fat, which is responsible for half a million premature deaths each year. Lisa Schlein reports for VOA from Geneva. Trans fat is an artificial toxic chemical commonly found in packaged foods, baked goods, cooking oils, and spreads. The World Health Organization reports 5 billion people are exposed to this toxic product, increasing the risk of heart disease and death. Tom Frieden is president and chief executive officer of the public health initiative Resolve to Save Lives. He says the global elimination of trans fat from food could prevent up to 17 million deaths from cardiovascular diseases by 2040. Very important to distinguish uh, artificial trans fat, which is a toxic chemical which has no valid use in the food supply and should be eliminated from saturated fat, which is uh, an inherent part of many food groups and which nobody is proposing to ban. Think of artificial trans fat as the tobacco of nutrition. It has no valid use. Progress has been made since 2018 when the WHO set a goal for the global elimination of trans fat in 2023. It says 43 countries now have implemented best practice policies for tackling trans fat in food, thus protecting 2.8 billion people from heart disease and death. Frieden, however, says that still leaves 5 billion people at risk from the devastating health impacts of trans fat. He says governments can stop these preventable deaths by enacting WHO's best practice policies. He notes several countries, especially Mexico, Nigeria, and Sri Lanka, are very close to passing these life-saving policies. All they need, he says, is a simple push to get them over the finish line. Policy wins in one country can help encourage other countries to take action. Uh, we hope that 
leaders such as India, Bangladesh, and the Philippines will be examples for all of the South and Southeast Asia region. And we hope that Nigeria, along with South Africa, which has already banned trans fat, will be a leader for Africa. Frieden says experience shows the industry can adapt, innovate, and replace trans fat with healthy alternatives. He notes this has been done in 43 countries. He says just a few large companies continue to manufacture this toxic product. He adds these companies will come into line when they see the days of trans fat are numbered. WHO reports most trans fat elimination policies have been implemented in high-income countries, mainly in the Americas and Europe. It says an increasing number of middle-income countries are following suit. As of now, no low-income countries have done so. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. And that's it for this Tuesday, January 24th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for spending your morning with us. For more African news and features, visit our website at VOA